3C is about community, character, and courage. And our mission is to love God and to love people. Let's tune in to this week's sermon. Today I want to get into the word quickly as we continue to speak about I need nothing. Come on, what do you need today? Say it again. Do you believe that? Well, let's see if the word can challenge us to see how well and how authentic our belief is that we can go from being a believer to a knower. That we can go from being wounded to just a scar. In other words, we can go from being incapacitated to having full capacity. Are you hearing me today? God wants to take you from where you are. Your best day is ahead of you. Your best moment is ahead of you. And I want to challenge us today to go to that next place, to to continue to allow, as the young man said, Preston, who who also, by the way, has a desire to be a police officer. And so we're excited about his dreams and we're busy praying that God will give him the absolute course. I would love to see him become a pastor of the next campus, but but we'll see. Maybe he'll police officer for a while and then come back with a little bit of. Yes, let's get into this. Go to James chapter one, verse four. It's our text this week, and uh, it was an amazing word that Pastor Jared started us on last week. We're going to continue to elaborate on that and to get it deep into our spirit. It's important that we repetitively read the word, that you meditate on it. You know, if you, what is meditation? Well, in, in, our, in our culture, we're able to revisit the sermons, and uh, most of my team that, that's close to me, I know by, by Tuesday afternoon, they've already rewatched this sermon three times over, Pastor Bird and myself and whoever preaches here. We watch it over and over again and we go to the notes and we relive it and we, on our cell night we, we, we speak about it. Why? We want to become what the Word says. We don't want to just know it, we want to know Him. We don't want to just know an it, because an it won't save you. Knowledge of the Word will not save you. Only the intimacy with the Father can save you. Because many will come in my name and have all the answers and all the knowledge, but Jesus doesn't know them. And what did He say? He said, depart from me, I don't know you. And so it's important today that as we go through things, that we listen to what the, the, the doctrine's teachings are, the, the apostles' doctrine are, and, and put them deep into our hearts. So let's read this quickly and go through this today. James chapter 1, verse 4. But let patience, everybody say let. let. That speaks to a decision on your part. It speaks to you deciding, are you going to let patience work? Are we going to let, and I know it's when you preach on patience, Look out, something's coming, right? Because if you ask for it, you have to go through the process to get it. It's one of those things, it's not handed out free, it's only attained through process. Am I helping you today? But let patience have its perfect work. See, everything with God, the standard's perfect. That's why we need His grace. That's why we have to walk at the pace of His mercy, at the pace of His grace, but never dilute the fact that it should be perfect. On your test, you should always expect to get a 100%. Why would you ever desire 30% or 70%? I know when I was in high school, if I got to a, to a low C, the bottom C, depending on the, the curve of the test, I was a happy person. But what did that do? It made me a stupid person. When I got to first year of Bible school, I flunked. Not because I didn't know how the word, know the word, or it wasn't learning the word, I didn't know how to write right. I knew how to write, but it wasn't accurate. And see, when, you, when the test comes, God wants us accurate in everything. And so on my dime, I had, to, I had to relearn some things. See, it'll cost you something. You think you're getting by and getting slick with getting through. You know, the years that I, I literally, I'm confessing. I've confessed this before, so it's, it's already under the blood. But I remember my brother, when he moved out of the home, he left all of his term papers. <laughs> and I took all of his A's and made a good healthy C or B out of them. <laughs> and some of them I probate him, wrote what he had, just to see. I'm like, how in the world they just know that I'm only his brother? <laughs> I got a grade based on who I was, right? Or maybe it was the Holy Spirit rebuking me. But I, anyway, my point is, if you don't put in the thing, if you don't let patience work, if you don't let the knowledge of the word, the intimacy with God become a part of who you are, you become fake. You become, you become useless because you just know about the Bible. You just know things, but you're not doing the thing. And see, when you're intimate with Christ, there's a passion and love to let other people know about Jesus. 
you'll walk off your, your path that you have planned when opportunity arises to bring hope to someone. You allow yourself to, to, to detour from what you think is important or what you think is urgent and do what is important. And I want to challenge you today to let this word, let it, let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The NLT says, needing nothing. Come on, say it again. I need nothing. The Amplified said, but endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work. How many want a complete work? You get a cavity taken out of your tooth. How many want the dentist to get all of it out? You don't want them to leave anything behind. I remember my first root canal it was a, quite the experience. The instrument's still in my jaw. It broke off in the middle of the process. And, and they got it all out and the pain was gone. But, you know, when we go through things, we want a complete work. We want God to do a thorough work in our life. Let's not uh, push God away just when he's getting ready to do something amazing in your life. When you're going through that trial, you're going through that test, maybe even an accusation. Our response to that tells us where our capacity is. Our ability to be who God has called us to be in the midst of the most horrifying things that can happen to you. The fearful things, the dread that can come through life. The endurance, let endurance, steadfastness, and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may perfectly that you can be people that are perfectly, fully developed with no defects, lacking nothing. How many want that? You know, in this perfection, we may not see it. We won't see full perfection, but we always go for perfection. We never settle with, oh, I did my best. In fact, I, I, would, I would challenge you to take that phrase out of your vocabulary, I did my best. No, I'm working on my best because tomorrow will be better. And I promise you, everything with God gets better in time. Everything with God, the best is always ahead. Amen? Amen? And I, the greatest analogy I can use is when I fell in love with this bride over here. Every day, every year gets better. My favorite time with her was not the honeymoon. Quite amazing. But that's not the favorite time. My favorite time with her is this moment. Right now. This moment. As she came out to, like, this morning when she was getting ready, I said... That looks like your prom gown. I had a flashback to 1981 when she wore this beautiful light blue gown with a knitted shawl that was white. And I remember going to the, with a clipping of her dress, going to the florist to get the exact same rip color ribbon and the roses white and blue to match exactly what she was wearing to go around her wrist. Man, I thought that was the best day. It wasn't. It was a good day, but the next day she dumped me. <laughs> that was a bad day. The good thing is, the next time I bought her flowers, it was forever. Come on, somebody. It was forever. And she took the time she needed to decide, right? Today you have a decision to make when it comes to your eternal relationship with the Father. Have you decided yet? Or do you just hang around people who know you're just familiar with people know. You drop Jesus' name at the dinner table, but you don't do what he's asked you to do. I want to challenge you today. And why do I keep harping this? Well, pastor, you're always harping on winning souls and making disciples. Well, you know what? There's nothing else to harp on. That's the only thing he asked us to do. In very detailed precision. He modeled it. Then he said, go do it. He modeled it, showed it how it can happen. And even with him, not everybody he reached fully developed and became what he wanted them to be. Because people still have the opportunity to let. That's why I asked the question, have you let, are you letting patience have its perfect work in you? Because I promise you, God is more than enough. What he's asked of you is more than enough. Philippians 4.11 says, not that I have ever been in need, Paul says, but I have learned. Somebody say, I've learned. I've learned. Come on, turn to your name. We need to learn some things. Tell them. You need to learn some things. And if you've already learned it all, then, you know, let's, let's get the pine box, put you in there and go home. Are you too tired to learn more? Okay, you're finished. No, there's always room for more. 
There's always room for more. We had the privilege of spending time with Miss Nita Parkinson. And if you're watching again this service, we love you. It was good to spend time in your home. But I, I looked at her and I don't know her age. She was 80 some years young. And even in the state where she's at, uh, she was speaking about the dream she had of what she wanted to do when she got back to the house. The trees that need to be trimmed, the house that's gonna be cleaned and all the things in her mind, she still had dreams, she still had passion to do something. And you know today, what is your passion? What is it that you want to do for God? What is it that has absorbed the oxygen in your life? What is it that is taking you and causing you to get up each morning? What causes you, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Because whatever it is, it'll be there at night when you lie down, even for the last time. I don't know about you, but I want his last command to be my first priority, my first thought, my first ambition of the day. Lord, how can I use this day? Whether I'm in court, whether I'm going to a hospital visit, whether we're doing a funeral, a wedding, whatever it is we do, visiting the sick, the elderly, helping those that are in distress on the side of the road, taking away from what I think is urgent and do what's important. Many times we think our little thing we do, yes, pastors as well, our, you know, a little thing called being a pastor, running a church, that's the little thing. The great thing is the people out there on the street. That's the call. Not here in this pulpit. This is the easiest thing and the most insignificant thing I do in the week. What I do Monday through Saturday is what matters. And when you do that, you will have trials. If you're not having trials, if you're not having attacks, then you're probably not a threat to the other team. He probably sees you as a part of his team because you've decided to not let. This is helping you. James 1, uh, 2, let's read that. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Pastor Jared did a good job preaching this last week. Knowing, somebody say knowing. knowing. Come on, say I need to know something. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing. Testing is to promotion. Temptation is unto failure. God does not tempt us. But he will allow us. When someone comes against you, guess what? Satan had to get permission from God to do it. So if your marriage is under attack, your family is under attack, your job, your career, your finances under attack. Consider my servant, Veronica. Consider my servant, Mike. Consider my servant, whoever. God believes in you. God believes in you. And so when you know that you're doing everything that you know to do and you go through something, hey, God's speaking to me. God, God thinks that I need some more capacity. What does that mean? Blessings on the way. Harvest is on the way. Somebody today is going to give their heart to Christ. There's going to be a new opportunity for someone to come to Jesus. What? Through patience. Let patience have its work. I like what it says in, in verse 4 in the New Kings. Says, but let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it to all liberally, without reproach. God's not going to rebuke you for asking for more. God's not broke. He's not going to, you know, sometimes we ask for more food when we were growing up. And the answer was no, because it was a limited source. Sometimes we wanted another glass of milk and the answer was no. The gallon had to last a week because mom put marks on it. <laughs> but having the deceptive, devilish mind that I had, and my dad said one day God's going to get a hold of that bowhead of your, I would go get an extra glass of milk and then go to tap water, shake it up, put it back in. <laughs> so by, by the end of the week, it was skim milk. Saved you a few calories, brother. <laughs> Secrets. And I didn't learn that at the restaurant, and I used it in the restaurant, what I learned at home. Come on, somebody. 
At home, it was just to get enough meal to be full. In the restaurant, it was to make my bonus, right? So you all have a little bit, you need a little bit of gangster in you, right? A little bit of thug mentality. <laughs> Pastor Bert says that all the time. We've got to have a little gangster in us. You know what you need gangster for? To take a stand. Yes. You have to be able to get to a point and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not going to attack anybody. But you can come so far, you're going to run against a wall you cannot yeah. handle. You, you're going to run against something that will, the Bible says, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. See, we can disagree without being disagreeable. We can look at the model of Barnabas and Paul, how they separated. They didn't agree. And John Mark, who caused the problem. And you fast forward through the whole thing. Paul left the team because of, because of this John Mark, who, who Barnabas had favor for, wanted to help give him another chance. But because they're all human, God always has used humans, by the way. Didn't you know that? It's the only ones he uses, the ones that are human. Not those who are holier than thou and so spiritual, but human, humanity. He takes the, the, the brokenness of the humble and he uses them. And before Paul died, who did he summons? John Mark. The guy who caused him to depart from his partner Barnabas. This water bottle, you know what? This, it won't fall off there again. I want my old stand back. It's happened all morning, so, and it, maintenance. Okay, now that you got a good laugh out of that, it's a pretty good kick too, a little side pass. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Coming down to verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, knowing. Why do we doubt? Why do we ever doubt God in anything? You don't know him. Well, I do know him. Well, if you doubt him when things come, when the various trials come, there's trials. Sometimes we think the line in, at the bank or the line at drive through is the trial. No. <laughs> As I spoke with Pastor Bert yesterday, we were strategizing about our communities that we're reaching. And, and then he was using the term, well, you know, in the poor this and, and the, the rich that. He says, and I realize in South Africa, the context is different. What we call poor is, a, is full benefits, a paid for house, a paid for car to get your food. What they call poor is, is poor. Yes. Yeah. There is no program. You know what their bailout program was for, for COVID for their country? A couple million bucks. Why we threw billions at the big fat lie. Yeah. Right. Are you hearing me today? So context is different, but, but for each of us, it's the same. Where are you today? How do you know God? Do you know him? Do you know him in the trial you're in? Do you know him in the failure that you just went through? Do you know him in the accusation? Do you know him in the trouble in your marriage? Do you know him when your child gets to an age where you no longer have influence and it looks like they're running the opposite of everything you've taught them? Do you know the king? Do you know the Lord of Lords who died that you could have conquered, that your promise could be, that your house is your promise and they shall be saved? Even when it doesn't look like. Even when they get to an age where they think they know everything. I said this in the first service. When your child gets to the age, now it's between the ages of 11 and 14 where they know it all. Let me help you with that. That is unrefined leadership. It just means you need to roll up your sleeves and get to work. Get to know God. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Get the principles of the Bible in their hearts at a young age. When they come to church, don't let them sit there and just play around. Teach them how to worship a living God. Teach them how to speak truth. Teach them to be excited about God's creation. Teach them what the rainbow really means. I, I was over at Jared and Alexis' house the other day, and we were in there talking. And next thing I know, I see Noah doing this. <laughs> And he's dancing, he's going all over the place, just, ah! And I, I said, what's going on? Rainbow! Beautiful rainbow, you know, because he's Noah. He thinks it's his rainbow. And it is. The day he was born, we saw a rainbow. On his last birthday, we saw a rainbow. And yesterday, we saw a rainbow. 
And he's pointing it out. He's, he knows there's something significant. And I said, yeah, you understand? The red is on the top. Why? That's the blood of Jesus. Why is it a bow bent over and bowing? Because God is not at war with his people. He has bowed and bent the bow. It's no longer aimed. It's a promise that never to destroy the water by water again. He'll never destroy mankind again. The next time he comes, the next time he says an end to perversion, the next time he brings an end to murdering babies, the next time he brings an end to war, it's because he's going to bring the church home. You need to know him. You need to know him. Jesus said, Many will come in my name and say, I've, I've baptized people. I've cast out devils in your name. Yeah, you use my name. It's that powerful. But I don't know you. I want him to know me. I want him to know me. I want him to know who I am. And I want to know what he thinks of me now. I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to find out how he feels about me now. I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to realize what I should have been doing. But I want to take the challenge that my pastor gives me over 20 years ago. Begin to challenge me to get off my blessed insurance and stop being a, a, trying to be a superstar for Jesus. Stop trying to be a rock concert for Jesus. Stop trying to be a worship leader standing in front of lots of people watching the worst G worship and, and music and, and, and looking just like the devil because that's what he needs. This, 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 this lie, this new gospel in the church, is worship pastor, it doesn't exist. Yes. A pastor is one who will lay down his life for the least. Yes. Yeah. That will put aside the urgent album that needs to be. And listen, we record albums. We're doing one next Saturday live. Can't wait for it to come out. But we don't have a worship pastor. We just have pastors. Yeah. We don't have someone that gets a title, sits in an air-conditioned office and writes music all day. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's artsy. No, you can be artsy, but you're a disciple maker. You can play the drums, but you're a pastor first. You may be able to sing, but you're a pastor first. As I watch Darwin, as he, he's up here every week serving, and, and, and during VSI, here he sat on the piano, and I, and I saw a Barnabas. I saw a man sitting here passionate about what he does, but more passionate about all the kids that can climb up on his shoulder, and they do something for God. We're all worship leaders. We're all disciple makers. We're all pastors. We're all shepherds in function. And some of us serve in the office of. But we're called to do this today. You need to know God. You need to let patience work to increase your capacity. Amen? For let not, let me finish this. He says, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. Why? Why do we doubt? We don't know him. When I played football, I had a few buddies I loved being on the line with me because I knew them. Especially my brothers. We played ball since we were little kids and you know, we never made it to any league because our county was too poor to have a football team. <laughs> North Dorchester Eagles. You know, we was bitter because Cambridge got all the money. Herlock got nothing. The only time I was ever on a team before I played my first game, my parents decided they couldn't afford to take me to practice anymore and I was taken off the team. Thank God because now I get to do this. Because all I wanted to do was play ball. I was looking for a way to get out of the unhappinesses I was surrounded with, the, the hurt, the pain. And when we played ball together, I felt a sense of belonging. But then when God starts utilizing you to win people to Jesus, your passion will change. And my passion changed was in a crisis. It was a crisis when a good friend of mine who died and I never shared Jesus with him. Now as a young person, I took Great offense to that and fear that God was mad at me because I let my best friend die without Jesus. I didn't understand age of accountability. All I knew is I had heard about the gospel since I was a little kid. And I never once shared it with my friend. It was in that year in the 10th, 11th grade where I switched. No longer will I be ashamed. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power to everyone who will believe. It's not our mission for the results. Our mission is to speak. 
No one comes to the saving knowledge of Christ unless God draws them. But your capacity will take you to a place where you can reach what someone says is the unreachable. Am I helping you today? Philippians 4.11 says, For that I was never in need, Paul says, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I now live, I now, I know how to live on almost nothing or everything. And Jared handled that well last week. Pastor Jared handled that well. So I'm going to skip because I'm out of time. I'm going to go down to today's message. Is that right? I got stuck on the recap. I say that, but we do that intentionally. How do I know that? Because I noticed in the parking lot, some of the cars still came in half empty. Because somebody didn't get it. I know you're in a hurry. You got dinner plans and stuff. You had all these kinds of plans, vacation maybe, whatever you're going to go do after church. Maybe it was inconvenient to bring someone to church today. Maybe it was inconvenient to roll down your window and pray for someone who's out in that heat today who needs Jesus. Listen, I'm talking to me. God spoke to me this week. I, I was headed back on Friday to get back to the service. It was, it was 5.30. Service started at 6. I was supposed to be here. And I was rushing home to get a quick shower. Why? Because I smelled like hickory smoke and hamburgers. Because I cooked burgers for the VSI that day. And I wanted to go home and get a quick shower, put on fresh clothes, come back. And I ran into a friend. On the road, unconscious. And I took time from the urgent to take time for him. Because when I saw him there, all I could see was Jesus. Have you ever had the thought, man, if I'd have been there during the cross, I would like to have done something for Jesus. Well, yesterday I got to do that. And I want to challenge you today. This is not about me, but it's about him. And today that young man gave his heart to Jesus at the 745. The world feels as if they've been forgotten. And when the trials come, when the delays come because of whatever, the accuser, don't forget your purpose. The whole reason for the, the attacks that come, some of it's testing that God allows, others is attack. Remember we're at war, right? That's why we put on the helmet, shield, sword. It's a battle. So people will attack you. The whole purpose of the attack is to take you off your game. Why does a defensive lineman get on the line? I'm going to eat you for lunch. You're going to regret the day. And you're, you're huffing and you're puffing and you're clapping. And, you're, and then the, the home team, it's third down. And the home team stands up and starts clapping. What are we doing? We're using a biblical method to confuse the enemy. When you clap your hands for the king of kings, the enemy becomes confused because the enemy does not understand unity. The enemy does not understand forgiveness. The, en the enemy does not understand redemption. It's when you're going through the storm in the toughest time that you can display the redemptive power of cross, the brightest in this world. Why a test? The test reveals the condition of the subject matter that you're supposed to be studying. It reveals what you have attained and do you have the context of what's been said. Simply put, these tests we go through, they reveal your spiritual condition. To know where you are. Trials. Trying. Testing. Proving. How, however, the, the idea of testing through trouble is caused by any sort of hardship, problem, or difficulty. When we go through things, there's things we go through, and as those trials come, God is testing us to see where we are. It's not tempting you. Tempting is to failure. Satan tempts us and accuses us. God will test us. And when you go, so well, why does he let that happen? Well, Satan has to get permission for anything he does. But God is preparing some people for capacity. When I look at these IP students and these VSIs that come in, why do we do that? 
I want to get everything I have inside of this, whatever is any value, into them before I die. That's it. I want my grandkids, I want my son and my daughter, where in three different campuses, I want them to have everything. I don't care about the house and the finance. We're going to spend all that and have a good time. But what God has taught us, you didn't get that. But what God has taught us and what we have gone through and the grief and the pain. I've seen some things in my life. I've seen the power of divorce and also the power of the cross. I've seen the power of suicide, also the power of resurrection. I've seen the power of addiction, also the power of redemption. And we have to help a generation let patience have its perfect work. Trials are going to come. Testing. Yes. Woo. Me too. Used in this previous verse, but it, it, it's the trials, it, and, and, but one that carries much the same meaning. It, it carries the same uh, thinking that, that as we go through a trial, God will use that trial to test us, to look. When you go to the hospital with symptoms, what do they do? They test and see how is it affecting the whole body. God's doing the same thing. He's looking at where you are. Why? As our brother said up here, Preston, he said, so we can receive the correction. It's not about punishment. God's not angry with any of us. He's yearning for you to get corrected. If your arm's broken, he wants it set and fixed. He wants to bind up that wound so you can go out and do what you're called to do. He doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to harm you. Even if you have rejected him, if you've walked away from him and you've, you said, I don't want anything to do with God. He's still knocking at your door. He's still willing and waiting for you to come back home and be a part of the team that he's called you to be a part of. He's still waiting to empower you and to equip you to reach your world. Why? Because you're the one there. And then it says various. Multiple areas. It's a badge of honor. Simple things. One of the most devastating things to my life was for someone to have wisdom enough to not allow me to youth pastor for more than a couple of years. Youth pastors who career youth pastor, they dummy down because it doesn't take a whole lot to pastor youth. Why? Because you've already gone through everything they've gone through. The moment one of our teams get married and we marry young around here, I said immediately you need to be start discipling married couples. Or are you going to stay a dumb teenager the rest of your life? And listen, we're all stupid until we turn 30. I learned that in Bible school. Actually, it was at a conference. Billy Wilson from New York, one of the greatest churches in New York City, loves the children. And he said, he said you know, you guys, you, you're stupid until you turn 30. Dave, you remember that, don't you? <laughs> or maybe not. In Chicago, we were in Chicago, and he was there for speaking to us. And Billy Wilson, you know, long black hair. He was a radical street evangelist, been stabbed several times preaching the gospel in New York City. And he made that statement. I thought, you know, okay, that explains a lot. So I was 29. I thought, hallelujah, next year, I won't be stupid. <laughs> but I think the more accurate translation is less stupid. Because at 60, I'm less stupid than I was at 30. <laughs> Can I get a big amen? amen? And so we need this endurance Let me make this statement. I wrote this down this morning early. I missed it the last service. And then I'm going to close out. When we're facing trials with a godly attitude, and that's what we have to do. Somebody say a godly attitude. Again, you have to know him. You have to know his dreams for you and how he sees you. We learned that the greatest part of joy, the greatest part of going through the trial is drawing closer to God. If there's anything else in your life that you enjoy drawing closer to other than him, you don't truly know him. Or you don't know him to the level you need to know him. I'm not judging you, but I am telling you some facts right now. This is fact. And, and if you're young in the Lord, then you're learning, okay, I need to get closer. If you're old in the Lord, you also need to get closer. See, what happens a lot of times, we, we learn so much 
to where we stop living in poverty or stop living like this and God gives us some things and then we settle. We settle. Okay, this is what he wanted for me. No, no, no. It's just the beginning. And we stop. Okay, I'm surviving. I got enough money to pay my bills and be a blessing to my children. I'll stop there. No, no, no. God wants you to have wisdom beyond your capacity. He wants to expand your capacity today. And I want to encourage you to draw close to the Lord, the source of all joy, by becoming more sensitive to his presence, becoming more sensitive to his goodness, become more sensitive, sensitive to his love and his grace, being grateful for his mercy. Our prayer life will increase and our interest in who he is and what he wants in this season becomes more and more prevalent that we can become lacking nothing. Come on, say, I need nothing. I'm going to close with this chapter. 1 Kings 19. Elijah flees and hides. 1 Kings 19, verse 1. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel. Somebody say Jezebel. Jezebel was a real person. The Bible refers to a spirit of Jezebel, a manipulative spirit. Jezebel served, and it says here uh, that, that uh, let, let me just read it. He told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. And, and, and it's a little p. And so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods, little g, because Jezebel served the false god. Jezebel served a fallen angel and all of the demons. The prophets of Baal were demonic individuals who practice sorcery, witchcraft, which by the way, that's what drug addiction is. The drug dealers of today are the sorcerers who pimp out our children, cause our 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds to be so sexualized and so drugged that their sexuality becomes their identity. I don't have time to get into all this. But I'm here to tell you today, what happened then is relevant to this moment we live in right this second. That Jezebel spirit is still alive and well for now. Now I'm gonna finish reading. I brought you up to, up to speed a little bit. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah who was a prophet of God, a faithful prophet. May the gods strike me dead and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Hear the voice of the enemy? intimidating it's a lie she has no capacity the enemy has no capacity to destroy you the only time the enemy has capacity is when we listen to the accusation we allow it to take root and we believe it just gave it a voice you see we're not here to attack ever anyone but I'm here to tell you hell fire will breathe down on the one who will touch the anointed of God and the angels of heaven are much stronger than these worn out demons that are down here. I'm telling you, they're getting worn out. Just look at the kids, what they did this week. Satan's getting worn out because he knows his time is short. He's working overtime and he's pushing his demons to bring destruction. He's pushing abortion. He's pushing LGBTQ. He's pushing sexualization of our children. He's pushing the transgender. It's not a freedom. It's a bondage chain that the, the prophets of Baal want to put our kids in a bondage and their identity is in their sexuality. It is a lie to the core. And when we step on that thing, there will be retaliation. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to stand when I don't know what else to do. The God that I know does. I don't have to know how to do everything. I just have to know the God who knows how to do. I don't have to know how to do it. I just need to know him. I need to have spent time with him. And being angry is not enough. It can't be, see, being angry just for vengeance or to payback is powerless. But to be angry and sin not is holiness. It's righteousness. And we will stand firm and we will protect the kingdom of God. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Listen to this. Elijah was afraid. I've been afraid. And he fled for his life. I did that. I ran and hid in a place called Pittsville. 
I literally jumped into a pit and took everything that I knew and put it into practice. I knew how to do business. I knew millionaires. I could raise the money to help these people. Forget the church. It's not working. The church does not work. I've been hurt. My dad couldn't do it. This church that I was a part of then wasn't doing it. It was dying. I said, I'm going to go to a place. I'm going to hide myself and I'm going to take what I know and what I can do in this flesh. I didn't think it was that then. I thought I was hearing from God. But God trapped me in that sand pit with awful sulfur water. <laughs> we tried everything. I never threw an ax in the well. Maybe that's what I should have done. Some of you will get that. And I'm down there hiding. And suddenly I realized that the pit's getting deeper and deeper. Surrounded by good men who were on my board. Went and talked to people who had a lot of money, had a multi-million dollar a year budget helping people. Good things were happening. Except my marriage and my kids were falling apart. I finally found one of my board members and confessed him. I said, I don't know why, but I have a spirit of suicide on me. I want to take my life. Oh, but Mike, you're a hero. Oh, you're such a good worship leader. Oh, you're awesome. That was the worst hellish years for me personally. The good news is I came out of it. And what I learned while I was there, what I learned in my disobedience, what I learned in my failures, I'm going to use it to fight for this generation. I'm going to stand for my kids. I'm going to stand for your kids. I'm going to stand for the grandkids. And we win. We win. Hallelujah. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to a town in Judah. He left his servant there. And then he went alone into the wilderness. Somebody say alone. alone. Traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors. I'm going to wind up just like my parents. If, if John and Carol couldn't do it, who do you think you are that you can do it? There was no model of success anywhere. Everything I had seen in the gospel, it did good. It had a little rise and then it fell. I don't know who needs to hear this today. But these are tears of thankfulness. These are tears of, a, of, of, of one who has gone through the fire. And these tears come when I see people deciding not to learn, deciding not to let patience, deciding to retire early from the kingdom of God. Take my life for I'm no better than the ancestors I, that have already died. Which was true. I am no better. But he's better he's better he's better Whew. I've had enough let me okay first five then then he lay down and slept under the broom tree but as he was sleeping an angel not a worn-out demon a fit powerful sent from God Holy Spirit guided angel Her. not a little naked baby angel playing a violin not that fairy tale stuff from Disney. A real angel. Whew. One, if you see, you would fall to your face in fear. Whew. The angel of the Lord came again. Oh, so let, me get, let me get this in. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but wherever you're sitting, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's your children, maybe it's a family member. Let's not quit on them. Listen, the fierceness of God will take care of those who come against us. Our job is to reach who's willing to be reached. Are you hearing me today? He looked around and there beside his head was baked bread whew, on hot stones and a jar of water. I like that, not a cup, a jar. So he ate and drank and he laid down again. Aren't you glad the angel didn't leave? Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, 
get up, eat some more. Get up and eat some more. Get up and drink some more. His mercy is new every morning. Get up and eat some more. His Holy Spirit is like refreshing water pouring over your head. Get up and drink some more. Get up and be what God has called you to be. Get up. You do not have the luxury to quit. We don't have the luxury to take a time out. The war is on and there's a battle. The angel of the Lord is with you. Eat of his word. Drink of his spirit. Remember what Jesus did. Get up and eat some more or the journey ahead of you. In other words, the dream I have for you will be too big for you. you we don't have the luxury for this. Like the little kid on the video. <sighs> My anger is towards the enemy today. Be angry. Be angry. Sin not. Speak the truth. Whew. I've never gone over this far. <laughs> I had to finish it. Actually, it says right here, if you can see, stop here. Let's all stand. Sometimes when you're fighting, I think I'm going to start putting a, an assistant down here to remind me where I'm at. I want to thank you for being here today. I believe that every day is critical. The truth of the matter is, many people all over this United States woke up this morning and today will be their last day on the planet. That's a fact. That's not doom, gloom, it's the truth. Many people will leave on a vacation and they're never gonna return. I had a real good friend and a servant of the Lord who left like over here with the team helping serve and making sure you have what we need and he left on vacation, started dying on the way back. He never made it back to the church. It's important that you understand the value. That's why the Bible says better to go to funerals than parties. It's better to be sober minded than intoxicated. We live in a culture where it's lies, lies, lies. How are you gonna tell the difference? You gotta know him. You have to have an intimate relationship with him. Remember, he's not angry at you. You say, well, pastor, you sound awful angry today. Yeah, I am angry, but not at you, not at God, at the enemy. Satan is the accuser. He's the orchestrator of every lie we must let. Let patience have its perfect work because it's then God can trust you with more capacity. Don't you quit on your dream. Don't you quit. You say, Pastor, what do you do when you pray and you pray and pray and, and the dream still dies? Well, remember Jeremiah 29, 11 says, the plans I have for you, go to the next plan. The call of God on your life will take you to the next place you need to go. Don't you fear. Well, what if, what if, what if? No what ifs. Just do what he tells you. Make his last command your first priority every day, your thought. Good morning, Holy Spirit, here I am. I'm off to the department store to shop, or I'm off to, to the police station to go to work. I'm off to the, the district office to whatever, to whatever you do. I'm off to go do commerce and business. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. He needs you. And it's not that he's messed up and panicking. It was the original design. His work will be done through us. That was the plan. That was the plan of redemption, that Jesus would come and live out a model, lay down his life, shed his blood, empower us, leaving a model of how to live that we can conquer and do. Well, I've already messed up. No, well, tomorrow's the next day. Get up today, get up this afternoon and do the next right thing. Get to know him. Get to know him. 
in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you today for this word. We thank you for this congregation that is gathered. Thank you for those on stream. Apologize, I didn't greet you guys. We love you. And we pray today that this word has challenged you. That we get up today and we do what we're supposed to do. We're not driven by the urgent. We're driven by what's important to the Father. God, what breaks your heart? What makes you angry? What makes you happy, Lord? We need to know these things. We want to be like you, Daddy. Father, we want to be like you today. Help transform our hearts to a new level of faith, we ask in Jesus' name. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and those of you watching by stream, we want to thank you for being with us. And I pray today that you choose Jesus if you've never done that. If you've never given your heart to the Lord, choose Jesus today. Make a decision to give your heart to him. And listen, it's in the doing of the Bible that proves where you are. The works don't save you, but because you have a true relationship with the Father, you will do the work. And so I challenge you today, as the pastor in the studio prays with you right now, that you would connect with us, that we can walk this journey with you. We love you. Church, can we give those watching by line a great hand? We love you. God bless you. Uh, what a powerful message today, and we just want to thank you for joining in. You know, I, I listened to this message, and I look at my life. There was a day when, you know, I needed everything in my life. Everywhere I turned, I need this. If I could just get this, you know, I found myself in the pit. And maybe you're like, hey, you know, I, I have so many needs in my life. If I can just get these things, I can get out of this, you know. You know, God's not calling you there anymore. You're not needed in the pit. You're not needed in the depression, the anxiety, the addictions of life anymore, the denials. You're not needed any there. You're not needed there anymore in your life. God is calling you today. So if that is you and you say, hey, I, I need my heart to change. I need my life to change. I need something different. You know, it wasn't until I encountered the love of God, the love of Jesus, that I never needed another thing but God in my life today, that I can have peace and the trials and the circumstances of my life. If that is you today and you're, you're hearing this message for the first time and you're like, shoo, that, that message so spoke to my heart, then I'm gonna pray this prayer. Maybe you've given your heart to the Lord before or this is your first time you say, hey, I've never given my heart to the Lord. I, I wanna know what it means to need nothing. It starts with that decision today to give your heart to Christ. So if that is you today and you say, hey, that's me, I want you to pray this prayer with me. This, this is the most life-changing choice you ever make in your life. And then we'll talk after this of what to do next. What are the next steps if I make this decision? So if that is you, I want you to pray this prayer with me today. Say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on my cross. That today, I have no need but you, Jesus. Thank you for your love, your grace and mercy that died on the cross for me. That today, I am a born again son or daughter of God and nothing can remove me from your hands thank you Jesus that today you set me on solid ground that I am a new creation in your mighty name we pray amen if you prayed that prayer with us today there's a number at the bottom of the screen we want you to call that number because your next step or maybe you've done this before and you say hey I need connection I'm not connected anywhere and I need help in this journey because my life is full of chaos and trial and I don't know what to do anymore. If that is you, please contact the number at the bottom of the screen. We have pastors standing by to talk to you. We want to see you connected this week in a cell with strong men or, or strong women that can walk this journey with you to get to the place where you need nothing. Amen. So we thank you today. We love you and we hope to see you connected in a cell this week. Have a great day.